Good evening, everybody. And uh, so how did life begin? Well, that's exactly what we are going to find out about tonight with Professor Lewis Dartnell talking about origins, uh, the beginning of life on Earth and how geology and uh, geography and climate uh, have all shaped uh, the way in which uh, the human race has developed, the way that it has, and with the political um, and economic uh, um, preferences that we have uh, shown. So it is going to be an extraordinarily wide ranging, uh, not least in time covered uh, talk. Um, and um, we're very grateful indeed to Professor Dartnell and the talk is now going to uh, take place and afterwards I'm going to be asking questions. This is one of the rare talks in the series uh, when unfortunately we can't have questions coming in from outside because it's a pre-record, but I hope nevertheless that you very much enjoy it. Over to Professor Dartnell. Hi, my name's Lewis Dartnell. I'm a professor at the University of Westminster and the field of my research is in a very new area of science called astrobiology, which is all about looking into the possibility of there being life beyond the Earth. Could there be ultra hardy bacteria in the surface dust of our next door neighbour planet Mars? And if so, what are the best signs of that life to try to detect with our Mars rovers or probes? And alongside that academic research, I take a lot of time in science journalism and writing. And what I'm talking to you about today is the topic of my latest book, Origins, How the Earth Shaped Human History. And what I'm trying to do with this new book is look and explore all the different ways that features of the planet we live on have had a profound influence on the whole of the human story from our very origins as a species in East Africa across the thousands and thousands of years of the history of civilization with the rise and fall of different cultures and societies and empires right up to the making of the modern world that we live in today. How have features of the planet itself, like plate tectonics or where different resources can be found or the churning circulation of the atmosphere had a defining influence on our human story? And what I want to do for you today is pick out from the book just three particular areas to talk about. We'll start first right at the beginning of our story with the making of us, our origin in East Africa. This is the region on the planet where we evolved as a species, not just Homo sapiens, but all of the other hominin, human-like species emerged here. And fundamentally, what needed to happen to transform hairy, tree-swinging, ape-like creatures into naked, hairless, bipedal, upright, walking and running human-like creatures is you need to, to to transform the landscape of East Africa. You needed to turn rainforest into grassland. And this in itself is something of a curiosity. If we zoom out from this region of East Africa to look at the whole planet and you allow your eyes to gaze across the midrift of planet Earth, across the equator, you'll recognize that this is where we find all of the great rainforests of the planet, the Amazon, the rainforests in Central Africa and smothering the 
the archipelago of islands in Southeast Asia. The equator is where it gets very warm, lots of water evaporates, it rises and cools, condenses and falls back as rain to support a wide band of rainforests all the way around the world along the equator, except for a weird, dry, little corner of East Africa where we were living. It should be rainforest and damp and wet, but it is dry and arid and grassy. And what can explain this change it becomes much clearer if we peel off this satellite view and instead look at a terrain map of East Africa. All the maps in this talk, by the way, are images and cartography that I generated myself when I was researching and writing this book. I came from a biology background and I've become a massive map nerd while I've been working on this new book, Origins. And what's been happening in this part of the world where we were growing up is that there's been a huge plume of mantle rising up from deep in the interior of the planet and pushing up into the underside of the African continental plate. The very crust, the very skin of the planet has bulged upwards exactly like a giant zit. What you can see in the map here shaded in red are the Ethiopian highlands. This is where the earth has been bulging upwards. And with that thinning and stretching of Earth's crust, the very skin of our planet ripped open in a characteristic Y-shaped pattern of cracks. It opened up the Red Sea at the top, as well as the Gulf of Aden. And then the third arm of that characteristic Y-shaped pattern of cracks is the great African rift valley running right down uh, side of the continent and it is in within that tectonic fracture in earth's crust that we evolved as a species the bulging up of the continent and in particular the mountainous ridges flanking the rift valley have formed a wall that has blocked the damp air from the ocean blowing over East Africa or the damp air from the rainforest blowing over the region and it is dried out. The previous landscape of the Jungle Book became that of the Lion King. Rainforest disappeared and became replaced by grassland and savanna, which was the fundamental driving force behind our evolution. But what's been puzzling paleontologists for years is, was it specifically about this tectonic crack in the crust of the earth that drove our evolution to become such an exquisitely intelligent and versatile and adaptable species? Plenty of places around the world have dried out and you evolve the camel. So what was special about here that drove our evolution to be so exquisitely intelligent. And the answer that's been emerging in recent years is that in East Africa, over the last five or six million years of our evolution, there has been a confluence of planetary factors. Not only the landscape of East Africa, and specifically the Rift Valley that funnels any rain that does form this dry area into a series of lakes running along the valley floor that I've highlighted in blue for you here. That geography and landscape is interacting with cosmic cycles in Earth's climate. The Milankovitch cycles, wobbles in Earth's orbit around the sun or the tilt of our planet. And during certain periods of these cosmic cycles, we enter into particularly unstable climactic epochs. During those unstable climactic periods, the string of lakes along the Rift Valley floor have flickered in and out of existence like a loose 
light bulb. And every time those lakes have appeared and disappeared, appeared and disappeared, they've fundamentally changed the amount of water that was available in the valley, the amount of vegetation that grew, the amount of wildlife that could survive there and that we could hunt and forage from. And so we evolved our large brains and our intelligence in order to outthink an unpredictable, chaotic environment. It was plate tectonics and cosmic cycles interacting with each other that gave birth to us as an intelligent species. Now, we didn't remain in this tectonic cradle of East Africa forever. We've migrated and dispersed out of our birthplace to now colonize the entire planet Earth. Humanity is the most widely distributed animal species on the planet. And it was the last great ice age, a period of particularly cold climactic conditions that lowered the sea levels so we could simply walk across dry seafloor to move between the continents, specifically to be able to walk from Eurasia right across to the Americas. And with the easing of the last ice age and the rising of the sea levels again, humanity for the first time in its existence experienced the interglacial period between ice ages when we weren't in East Africa. And our response to that was to invent agriculture, to domesticate wild animal and plant species, to settle down in increasingly dense populations, the villages becoming towns, become cities, and the birth of civilization itself. Now, I wanted to jump forward to a more recent chapter in our history, and incidentally a later chapter in the book, which looks at the global wind machine, how not movements of the earth beneath our feet and tectonics have influenced human history, but the invisible movements of the atmosphere high above our heads, specifically with the age of exploration and discovery, the age of sail from the European point of view. Now, this map here is slightly counterintuitive at first, because I'm not trying to show you the terrain on the land and the continents. I wanted to show you the landscape of the sea floor. So what we're seeing in blue here is the terrain on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, with the white mass on the right hand side being the bulge of Northwest Africa, with Europe to the north above that, the Iberian Peninsula sticking out into the Atlantic. And in the early 1400s, European navigators, Portuguese and Spanish explorers first started venturing out into the vast expense, to the vast expanse of this stormy, tumultuous ocean. And the stepping stones that drew these navigators out were the Atlantic archipelagos, places like the Canary Islands, the Cape Verde Islands. You can see in this map here that these archipelagos of islands are no more than the very peaks of huge underwater mountains. The Azores are the tops of volcanoes making up the mid-Atlantic ridge as this ocean continues to widen and expand. So the Portuguese explorers headed down the north African coast, following the direction that the winds and the ocean currents were already blowing. But to get back home again, these sailors faced a problem. You can't simply turn your ship around and head back the way you came, fighting against the very winds and ocean currents that brought you there in the first place. Instead, what they realised they had to do was completely counterintuitive at that time in history. They realised they had to turn their boats 
away from the safety of the shoreline, from the landmarks that they knew how to navigate by, and instead head out into the open expanse of the deep ocean until they encountered a different set of winds and ocean currents that would take them back home again. They completed what they called a volta do mar, a return of the ocean, a great loop through the sea, taking advantage of different wind systems. When the Portuguese explorers had headed further down the African coastline, the loop they needed to take to return themselves home was so wide through the ocean that they stumbled across the Azores, a set of islands that no human had visited before. Now what these explorers were doing was getting their first inkling of a global pattern of wind systems and ocean currents that they blow. This North Atlantic was just the first piece of the jigsaw puzzle of the entire planet that we came to understand. Now, this view makes sense when we think again about how around the equator is where the warm air rises, as we saw earlier in this talk. That rising air cools and rolls over through high altitude until the atmosphere sinks back down to the Earth's surface at about 30 degrees north and south. The equator is where you find the rainforests, 30 degrees north or south with the dry descending air is where you find most of the deserts around the world. And then to complete this great vertical circuit, the atmosphere has to return to the equator along the Earth's surface. And that's just what we call the winds. The only other important detail is that while the atmosphere is completing these great vertical currents, the entire planet is turning beneath this atmosphere, which creates the Coriolis effect. The winds are deflected to one side. So on either side of the equator, we find this wide band of winds that always, always blows towards the west. These are the trade winds. And then a band on the outside of that, where the atmosphere is churning in the opposite direction, creates a band of winds that always, always blow in the other direction. These are called the westerlies. So in order to complete trade links, networks across the oceans, to knit together the continents, all you need to do is understand that you move your ship north and south between these opposing bands of winds, using like conveyor belts to take you in different directions. And we came to exploit this understanding of the global pattern of the winds and the ocean currents in the very early stages of, of globalization from the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s to create these vast trade routes around the world, joining the world up in a way that had never been done before in history. The Portuguese found their way around the southern tip of Africa, across the Indian Ocean, and to the route to the source of the Spice Islands. They dominated that spice trade for, for a period and generated huge wealth for themselves on that trade. Now, it turns out that the only way to get around the bottom of Africa, following the way that the winds and ocean currents will take you, is to steer such a wide course through the South Atlantic that you stumble across South America. The reason that Brazil speaks Portuguese, whereas the rest of the continent speaks Spanish, is simply that is the way the winds were blowing the Portuguese explorers. The Spanish crossed the Atlantic, discovering North America, first with Columbus, of course, and then explored overland across this new continent to become the first European eyes to see the vast ocean on the far side of this new world, the peaceful ocean, the Pacific. And then 
the Spanish established the longest range trade route of the history of sail across the Pacific Ocean. They started in China, loading up their ships with porcelain and silk or other luxury commodities. They sailed north to the coastline of Japan, where they knew they could pick up the band of westerly winds that would take them the entire breadth of the Pacific Ocean until they made landfall on the American coastline. Here they headed down the shoreline till they got to Mexico and their colonies and silver mines in Mexico. They loaded up their ships with that silver coin and took it along the trade band, trade winds band back across to China, completing this enormous trade route. The reason that California was so geopolitically important for hundreds of years, the reason that cities like San Francisco and San Diego and San Jose were founded in the first place is simply because that is the only place you can get to after sailing across the Pacific. That part of the coastline is where you need to build ports and towns to restock your ships before they can head down the coastline to Mexico to complete that trade circuit. The Portuguese realised they could cut out, sorry, the Dutch realised they could cut out the Portuguese on their spice route by taking a shortcut across the Indian Ocean, exploiting a particularly intense band of winds known as the Roaring Forties. This is literally like a motorway in the ocean. You can shave off thousands of miles of that crossing, but only if you know where to take your turn off from that motorway in the ocean, where to start turning north again back towards the islands of Southeast Asia. Because if you miss your turning, you plough into the coastline of Australia. And you wouldn't believe the number of shipwrecks along that coral reefs of the West Australian coastline from sea captains who've missed their turning on that Roaring Forties route, on that Brower route, that Dutch route across India. The reason that Cape Town was founded in South Africa became politically important was because that's where you need to build a port before your ships sail out into the open ocean on this long distance crossing of the Indian Ocean. Now, arguably the most important trade route for the subsequent playing out of history was the Atlantic Trade Triangle. This was established right in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution when Britain and then the rest of Northern Europe had worked out how to get machines to make things for you, how to mass produce very, very cheaply, very, very quickly products like textiles or weapons. And these manufactured goods, the products of the Industrial Revolution, were sailed down that old Portuguese route down the coast of Africa until they were sold to African chiefs and traded for human labour, slaves who'd been abducted from their homes, bundled in chains into the holds of these ships, and then taken along that trade winds route to North America, where they're forced to work on the plantations around the colonies in North Africa, in North America, growing basic plant products like cotton or tea or coffee or sugar. And then these raw plant products, the outcome of that slave labour was taken back across the Atlantic, along the Westerlies trade route to Britain and North Europe, where we then used our machines to turn those cotton fibres into textiles, which we then sailed back down to Africa and so on and so on. This Atlantic trade triangle was almost like a great economic cog sat right across the North Atlantic, being blown round and round by the wind patterns of the planet 
and generating enormous profits on every leg of that triangle for its masters, for the slave traders. And all of these trade routes, the North Atlantic trade triangle, the Brouwer route, the Dutch route, the Spanish route across the Pacific, each of them have left their fingerprint in the development through history and therefore the patterns we find in the world today through that history of globalization and the making of the modern world. The churning of Earth's atmosphere has left its imprint in the way our world looks today. And we don't just see this fingerprint of the planetary in the global patterns from the age of sail, we can see the influence of the planetary in even modern politics, in how people choose to vote in elections. And the example of this I've got to show you is in this region of the world, in North America, USA. And if I peel off the satellite view and instead show you the political map, how people chose to vote in the last presidential election, we see, perhaps unsurprisingly, that this region of the southern states is on the whole a Republican area. This is a sea of Republican red. But some counties in the southern states do vote Democrat. We can see a thin band of Democrat voting counties along the banks of the Mississippi River. But we can also see this very distinctive thin crescent of Democrat voting counties arcing its way across the southern states. And this doesn't correspond to anything you can see on the ground. If I peel off that political map and show you the terrain map, that crescent doesn't correspond to a river or a mountain range. And that pattern becomes clear only when we peel off the terrain map and instead look at the map of underlying geology. I'm showing you now rocks beneath your feet in uh, those shades of gray, arcing out from the course of the Mississippi River. These rocks beneath your feet are about 70, 75 million years old. And if I overlay on that geological map, our political map again, you'll notice there is an astonishing correspondence between rocks beneath your feet that are 70, 75 million years old and people choosing to vote for Democrats. This makes no sense at all. These people aren't geologists. They're not digging in their back garden or indeed their backyard and saying, Ack, I wanted to vote for Hillary, but now I've got to vote for Trump instead because the rocks in my back garden are too young or too old. But what is going on here is that there is a long chain of cause and effect. One thing leading to the next, stretching back through millions of years of our planet's history and hundreds of years of recent human history. And these rocks were laid down 70 million years ago in a period of Earth's history, a chapter known as the Cretaceous. And during the Cretaceous period, Earth's sea levels were much, much higher than they are today. The ocean lapped up right through the middle of North America in a great inland sea. And so the rocks laid down in that period of history were effectively thick deposits of seafloor mud, which became buried by more recent layers of rock and have been eroded and revealed again along that particular band of Cretaceous age rocks in the southern states. And it was realized in the early 1800s that when that ancient seafloor rock erodes again, it gives you a soil which is particularly fertile and productive for growing cash crops like cotton, things you can sell back to Europe for hard currency. And unfortunately, 
in this period of history, because cotton is such a pinnacky crop to harvest, that meant slave labor. People were abducted from the homes in Africa, taken across that trade winds route across the Atlantic, as we saw earlier, and forced to work on those plantations along that Cretaceous band of 70 million year old rocks. And even today, after the Civil War, after emancipation from slavery, after the Civil Rights Movement, still today, after hundreds of years of history, the densest population of Black African Americans still live along that Cretaceous band of rocks. People who unfortunately still today suffer from socioeconomic problems of poor opportunity, poor salaries, poor health care, poor education. People who are much more likely to vote for Democrat election promises than Republican ideals. And the city that I've marked for you on this map, the city of Montgomery, is the place where in 1955, a black woman called Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white gentleman on the bus. The very epicenter of the whole of the civil rights movement, which revolutionized society in the United States, began smack in the middle of that band of Cretaceous age rocks in the southern states. There is this profound link from the geology and the soil through agriculture and economics and sociology and, econ and um, modern culture through to the political map and how people choose to vote in elections. And just to demonstrate to you, I've not cherry picked the only example around the world of where this link between the planetary and the political is evident. Here's an example from much closer to home on our own shores. On the left, I've shown you the constituencies that voted Labour in the last general election. And on the right hand map, also shown in red, are rocks beneath your feet, which are about 320 million years old. And again, there is an astonishing correlation between the two. People voted left. They voted Labour if they happen to have rocks beneath their feet, which are about 300 million years old. Now, this particular link will be much uh, more obvious to you when I tell you that the name of the chapter in Earth's history 300 million years ago was the Carboniferous. These areas of red on the map are the coal fields. This is where we've been able to mine underground and dig up fossilized forests, coal, which we realized we could throw into our furnaces in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and power ourselves through that transformative development in world history. And the latest step in that particular chain of cause and effect is that the Labour political party grew out of trade unions of the coal miners. So even here, there is this deep link between features of planet Earth and our modern lives through the various steps of geology and planetary features through culture and sociology and economics. Now, these are just three stories that I've had time to tell you about from the book, from Origins in this short talk. And there are plenty of other stories in the book that you can read about. Things like what catastrophe half a million years ago made Britain feel so independent of Europe? What caused us to become an island in this original Brexit event? Why do most of us eat a bowl of cereal or a slice of toast for breakfast? How does the planet determine even what we eat for breakfast? Or how did Holland's drowned landscape create the modern financial system? Why was capitalism born in the low-lying regions of the Netherlands? And you can find out the answers to these questions, what, what I call the clickbait of the book, with a copy of Origins, How the Earth Shaped Human History. If you're interested 
in any of my other writings. My previous book, The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World from Scratch, is a thought experiment on how you could reboot civilization after an apocalypse, how you could accelerate your progress back through history a second time around, if only you had the most useful understanding and knowledge written down in a how-to guide for building civilization. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lewis. Hi there, Anthony. How are you doing? Uh, it's been a few years. And uh, let's begin uh, straight off after that wonderful talk uh, and ask, um, how do we know um, what happened in East Africa? What is the evidence that's left behind about the origin of humans? And can you talk a little bit about the uh, the different um, varieties of early humans uh, who then came into Homo sapiens? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of evidence uh, we've been finding in the last few decades uh, in, East, in East Africa. So I spent my own childhood growing up in Kenya, in Nairobi, and indeed that's uh, the childhood for us as a species as well in, in this East African Rift Valley, as I was talking about in the presentation. Yeah. And since uh, the Leakeys um, back in the, in the 50s and 60s, we've been discovering more and more uh, hominem skeletons. Uh, Paleontologists have been finding the fossil evidence, not of dinosaurs, but of our own ancestors. We've been able to piece together this family tree, the, the bush of related hominin human-like species and where we fit in to that family tree, where Homo sapiens fits in. And then the next step of the story is how we left that cradle, that birthplace, sure. and spread around the world uh, uh, and interacted absolutely. with other human-like species as we went. Uh, absolutely. Um, so it's always intriguing to know um, how science aids history and how we can understand more about uh, the origins of life because of scientific advance. So where do you think scientific advance is going to go, Lewis, in the future? And what more are we going to learn in the next 50 years? <laughs> so I think I think you're absolutely right, Anthony, that um, history is informed by uh, reference to texts and documents and writings and the written record that humanity has created. That is what, what history is. It's, it's our history. It's our, it's our written record. But that will only take you back so far. And so what I've tried to do with this new book, with Origins, is push that story, that human story, back further and further and further by not just referring to historical texts, but the sort of texts that science has learnt to read. You know, the, the, the record left behind in fossilised bones or an isotope signatures around the planet, the geological record that teaches us how our planet is a dynamic world that's been changing over millions of years. So yeah, there's huge things to be promised uh, in science and in my own actual discipline of astrobiology and looking at the possibility of life beyond the Earth. You may be aware of quite a big news story that broke just a day or two ago to do with our next door neighbour planet, Venus, and possibility that we've just discovered uh, the signs of life in the clouds, in the upper cloud decks of Venus. So science often advances with uh, surprises and, and jerks. It can often be quite jolty when you suddenly make a new discovery, a new advance that no one was anticipating. It was unexpected, but it pushes that field forward um, a step. And, and indeed, one of the University of Buckingham's academics had a uh, letter in the Times on the 16th of September on that very subject. He's yeah. been long uh, talking about life beginning outside uh, the Earth. Uh, Lewis, what do you say to theists who say that, uh, that, that the beginning of human life uh, is all divinely or providentially explained? Uh, are you saying that it was just uh, random? Uh, and if you are, why is uh, Earth, uh, why the universe? Well, theism, religion is a belief system. Um, science is another way of coming up with origin stories, with, with genesis stories. I would obviously, as a scientist, argue that the stories that you generate and create with science are more fulfilling and likely to be more accurate because they're supported by many lines of evidence. You don't have to believe what I'm saying about the evolution of, of, of human life. 
if you wanted, you could spend time at university learning about this discipline and then convince yourself from the evidence and the data why we think this is a, com a more complete story of where we came from. I wasn't, uh, in fact, um, asking about the evolutionary um, or, or those theists who are opposed to um, Darwin's ev evolution, but many um, in all faiths uh, who totally embrace uh, and indeed many are leading scientists and yet they still uh, believe that uh, the, the the path, the trajectory of history had a divine uh, motivation, inspiration. Uh, you're saying that that doesn't fit in with your theory, although, or are you saying that it could fit in with your theory? Well, if, if you're asking me personally whether I am a religious person, I, I am not. Some scientists are religious, some scientists are not religious. Some religious people are scientists, some religious people are not. As far as I'm concerned, a belief system in uh, the meaning of life, getting getting a value system for your mm -hmm. life is very different from how we come to understand the world around us in terms of you know, the creation of the earth or the creation of us as a species. These are questions which can be and have been answered by science, whereas perhaps 2000 years ago, before science existed, people came up with alternative stories, alternative genesises, genesis for, for where these things came from. But I, I don't see there being a necessary antagonism between religion, religion and science, that they're different dimensions, they're different aspects of, of the human experience. In your talk, uh, you uh, obviously discussed the last Iron Age, I'm sorry, the last Ice Age, <laughs> forgive me, Ice Age. Uh, Lewis, uh, can you give the dates for that? So um, the most recent Ice Age was one of perhaps 40 or 50 Ice Ages in this current chilly period of, of Earth's climate. And it would have been in full swing about 100,000 years ago, uh, with it thawing out and us returning to the interglacial period where we invented agriculture and, and civilization and, and, and the climate we find ourselves in today by about 20, 22,000 years ago, when that ice age was starting to thaw out. And that was the ice age when um, the humans came out of the Rift Valley uh, and w had wandered uh, and wandered over what is now sea. Is yeah, exactly. exactly. And, um, and so were they wandering over, over ice or, or, or had uh, the, the sea fallen? Yeah, the sea levels had dropped by um, 100, maybe 120 metres around the world. There was an enormous drop in global sea levels simply because so much water had become locked up in these four kilometre thick ice sheets that covered North America, Northern Europe, Siberia. Um, so that, that meant that there was a land um, uh, uh, walkway between what uh, Alaska and uh, uh, and uh, uh, east uh, uh, northeast of Asia um, uh, Russia um, so there was one there and then across from um, Britain to, to Europe uh, yeah. what what are the um, w w what now became walkable also yes yeah, so Doggerland opened up yeah. effectively the seabed of the North Sea today became exposed as a very large area of gently rolling hills that would have been covered in grass and, and game. So uh, our ancestors would have been hunter gatherers prowling across this, this dogger land, this region of what has now become swamped and inundated as the North Sea. And by about 1000 AD, with Norse Viking and other North European fishermen, uh, that same region on the planet became um, a prime fishing ground because of the hills that were now swamped and gave good fish grounds, um, which is what started drawing us out into the North Atlantic and then eventually to America. So just that one bit of the planet yeah. has had different roles to play uh, in our story, in our history. And all human beings uh, derived out of that exodus out of the Rift Valley or were there other places where uh, human homo sapiens antecedents um, uh, originated? So all humans around the world, uh, not in Africa, today descended from that uh, migration event, that dispersal. Oh, and that. when you were talking, uh, Lewis, it was such a, a, a fascinating talk. Um, 
I was wondering what was the motive for um, the wanderings to take place? Simply population pressure. So you can look at a map and you can see these big bold arrows moving around between different land masses and it you know, almost looks like troop movements during the Second World War with a blitzkrieg coming across here and then the pushback um, later on in the war. And that, that sort of map, I think, gives a distorted perspective, a distorted idea of what it would have been like. That there wasn't directionality or any particular intention in these migrations. It was simply populations of humans who were hunter-gatherers. They were on their feet, they were moving around all the time, moving with the seasons, moving from one year to the next. And they simply disperse. It's almost like diffusion. It's almost like opening up a bottle of perfume in the corner of a room and it's slowly dispersing to fill the room. And have we any idea of the numbers of um, humans before the, the, the last ice age, so 100,000 years ago? Well, looking at the genetic data, you can sequence uh, the DNA of people living all around the world today and then effectively draw a grand tree of, of humanity, a family tree for people who dispersed out. And by looking at those genetics, it seems that those original migrants uh, were perhaps only a couple of hundred people, maybe a thousand or two uh, initial migrants coming out of Africa who then bred uh, and, and, and produced the human populations we find uh, uh, all around the world today. You talk uh, then about uh, the birth of civilization, urbanization. Um, now, I, I've always been led to understand that happened in four different areas, China, India, uh, Iraq and Egypt, at roughly the same time. I mm. have no idea if that's true, uh, Lewis. Uh, is it true? And <laughs> if it is, uh, why, why was it happening at roughly the same time in all these places? Yeah, you're pretty much pretty much spot on. There were um, we think independent origins of civilization in Egypt, Mesopotamia, uh, the Indus River Valley and uh, in northern China, and then it spread through the Blue Plains of southern China. And I do deal with this in one of the early chapters yeah. of Origins, and in fact it comes up in different places, because there's effectively two questions there. There's why did they all happen at pretty much the same time, but there's also the question of well, why did civilization first emerge in those spots on the earth and not somewhere else. And broadly speaking, the question of when comes back to something you were asking about earlier, which is the last ice age. The current interglacial period that humanity is living in right now, between ice ages, where it's much warmer and more clement, um, is the first time that our species has ever experienced an interglacial period when we were no longer in Africa. And our response to that seemingly was to invent agriculture. We started putting seeds into the ground to grow crops and then start selectively breeding them rather than just picking berries and tubers that we found uh, as we roved around. So there was almost like a starting gun had gone off with the climate on the earth as to when we started settling down and developing agriculture. As to the where, um, many of those first civilizations that you mentioned are in a particular tectonic setting. And in particular Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, between the Tigris and Euphrates, um, is in a particular geological setting where you have the Zagros Mountains, which is a huge bulk of rock that sits very heavy on the crust of the earth. And the earth's skin sags down from the weight of that mountain range, which is where the course of the rivers flow down, dump a lot of sediment. So it was a tectonic setting that not only created us as an intelligent species, but also gifted humanity with the ideal places for making agriculture easy for us when we're first working it out from first principles. Uh, and what did it consist of, Lewis, um, uh, urbanisation, the beginning of civilization, apart from um, uh, settled farming? Uh, to what extent uh, were there commonalities in, in housing and civic buildings, education, health, law, legal systems? Language? Well, yeah, so fundamentally, that the beginning of civilization was uh, increasing numbers of settled populations in the same spot. You get increasing uh, densities of humans, which means villages become towns, become cities. It becomes sort of cities we find along the Tigris and Euphrates, or along the Nile, or along the Indus, or along um, the Yangtze. And whenever you have densities of 
people living in the same place, that starts driving other demands, other necessities, uh, like um, civic law. You have to have a way of keeping people to behave, behave themselves, to have law and order. So all of what we would call civilization, as it gets more complex with thousands of years since then, has got its roots in these first people settling down in areas around the world where it was easy to grow crops and also keep animals, keep livestock uh, to feed for us and provide for us and, and give us relatively comfortable lifestyles. So this was roughly 6,000, only 6,000 years ago. Yes, yeah, so, so from about 4,000 BC, about 3,000 BC, we see the emergence of these first cities um, along these rivers, in these rivers. Only, only 50 centuries ago, it, it doesn't seem that long ago, uh, <laughs> does it? Um, and then you skipped in, in the, the talk, uh, but not the book, through to the sea travel um, uh, in the from the 14th century onwards. Um, so two questions there are the Silk Road, the, the land travel. Did you not talk about that in the, the, the talk uh, because it was less affected by <laughs> uh, geography? Um, let's take that first. No, so uh, it turns out when you're <laughs> being ambitious and biting off perhaps more than you can chew by trying to write a single book that covers the whole of human history and the whole history of the earth, there's quite, that's, a, that's lot, difficult. quite a lot to write about. So necessarily in the book, in, in 100,000 words, in 300 pages of the book, you have to be a little selective about what themes and grand topics, grand trends you focus on. And definitely when you're doing a quick 30 minute presentation, showing the maps and telling the stories, you have to just pick and choose, cherry pick what you think are the most interesting stories. But there's an entire chapter on the Silk Roads and why that overland network of trade routes draped across the backbone of Eurasia, followed the routes it did and what influences that had on the grand course of human history over thousands of years. And uh, I picked the, about 500 uh, AD or? Well, there's evidence that was trade um, from Mesopotamia across to India uh, thousands of years ago. Like overland trade is very, very ancient. We were trading within Africa before people migrated out. Um, but the Silk Roads, in, insofar as that means any one thing in particular anyway, uh, reached an early heyday during the Han Dynasty in China in the, in the east and the Roman Empire in the west around the Mediterranean uh, Sea, this, this inland sea. Um, so there's a lot of crosstalk and trade and communication of ideas uh, across the backbone of Eurasia at that period. And then much more recently, um, with the Mongolian Empire, which once again unified Eurasia so that trade became lubricated. It removed the friction to trade and that shared a lot of knowledge and technology. Things like the blast furnace for making steel uh, reached Europe from China down those silk roads. But other things were communicated as well, including diseases. So the Black Death, the bubonic plague, reached uh, Europe, reached the Mediterranean um, down those silk roads, down those, down those trade routes. And people were traveling by camel and by horse 50 miles a day. Do we know how, what would be a good day's travel? I, I don't know off the, off the top of my head, but you're right, the, there was a lot of camels being used on the Silk Road, particularly through uh, Central Asia where it's very dry because it's behind the Himalayas. So there's a physical geography reason for that. Uh, but also across the Sahara, there was a um, very active gold and salt trade across the Sahara which in fact was one of the early impetuses for the Portuguese to find a sea route to where down the West African coast to find where that gold was Across coming from. Across the Sahara. Across the Sahara. And they basically kept on going to find the bottom of Africa, the southern tip of Africa, to then try and get to uh, the spice, uh, the source of the spice. And I wondered what it was um, technologically um, that prevented the Phoenicians, the Greeks, uh, uh, the Romans, sailing out across the Atlantic. Uh, why was it not uh, until the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries as you just described uh, that this uh, great act um, uh, of uh, by the Portuguese and Spanish uh, happened? Mm. So this, the Phoenicians were, were master seamen. They, they had a sprawling trade route and trade network uh, across the Mediterranean. They headed right down the African coast, uh, finding the source of, of Tyrian purple, of mm. the dye that they traded. 
But these were galleys, these were rowing boats, effectively. And there is partly a technological advance, a level of sophistication you need to achieve to have a ship which is seaworthy in the heaving storms of the North Atlantic compared to the tideless, more placid waters that you find in the inland sea of the Mediterranean. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that Columbus was not the first person to reach the Americas, not the first European. Um, and Norse mariners made it across to uh, Iceland and then Greenland and then the mainland of North America hundreds of years, centuries before uh, Columbus tried to make across the Atlantic uh, to find the source of, of the spice in, in India. Obvious question then, why is so much made of 1492 and, and why were the, <laughs> the, North, the Norse traveling? So, I mean, Columbus was something of an idiot, right? He was entirely wrong in his calculations of the of the size of the earth and had he not had it not through blind luck been the fact that he stumbled into an entire continent in the way Columbus would have died far out at sea no one would have remembered him he wouldn't he would have been lost the pages of history um, the Portuguese refused to fund his his campaign the Spanish basically only supported his madcap idea to try and reach India by going the wrong direction, simply because it cost them nothing. It was a cheap punt for them. And they just finished um, uh, on the Reconquista. They just finished taking back over the Iberian Peninsula from, from the Moors, effectively. Yeah. So they thought, let's just take a punt. You know, what have we got to lose? Columbus effectively fudged the numbers. And that's the, the reason the Portuguese would refuse to support him, because they knew the earth was far too big for that sea route to ever be feasible. And it's only if you get to the Americas and then travel across land and then try to cross the Pacific, um, as I talked earlier, um, by using the trade routes and the westerlies, that that uh, maritime route between east and west across the Atlantic becomes feasible. Um, it, it was just blind luck that Columbus was successful. I just to pick you up on the, um, on the difference between the ancient classical um, uh, or powered, uh, but also sail supplemented mm. uh, um, uh, ships uh, of 2000 years ago. Uh, and the, 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 the wind, was it that you required so much food to, to, to nourish the, 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 the slave um, oarsmen, uh, that, that you didn't have enough, you couldn't have enough capacity uh, to, to, to get a boat across, or was it uh, more about um, navigation devices. Um, can you say anything more about what it was that allowed the boats in, in the mid uh, second uh, millennium uh, to, to, to have the audacity to go all the way across the Atlantic and then the Pacific? Mm, so the, the galleys of the classical era of antiquity um, were rowing boats. They had a range of perhaps a day or two's rowing before your entire crew is exhausted. You're using human muscle supplemented by sails of course but primarily they've been propelled by the by the oars and you had a range of a day or two and therefore the nature of trade across the mediterranean was a very dense network of entrepots and ports um a day or two's travel between them to cross the atlantic is um a matter of weeks so it, it's an, it's a it's a vastly different scale of the time you need to be spending at sea and the technological innovation that lay enabled the Portuguese and then the Spanish and then the Dutch and, and French and, and, and the English um, was a kind of ship called the, the Caravel. It was much uh, hardier in terms of its hull, it was different ways of building a wooden hull. It had a fore and aft sail which made it very nimble. You, you could tack back and forth easily into the wind so it made it very good uh, for exploring in unknown directions, exploring unknown wind patterns, exploring coasts where you don't know if the tide or the currents are going to dash you against the rocks. You need a particularly nimble ship. But the point that I didn't labour too much when I was talking that presentation about the establishment of these very long range transatlantic trade routes that, that the Brower route and the um, Atlantic Trade Triangle and the Manila Galleon route. A galleon, by comparison, is a big, bulky, not particularly maneuverable ship that can only really sail the direction the wind is going. You are maximizing your cargo hold to earn a tidy profit in that journey. It's a simple ship to sail. You don't need a large crew. You don't need many provisions on board. 
and you just stuff your hold with silver or whatever it is you're, you're transporting. But that limits you to only go the way the currents or the winds will take you. And therefore, it was atmospheric circulation which dictated where these trade routes were found. And therefore, hundreds of years of European uh, empire building and trade routes and, and colonization that you know, made the modern world through, through globalization. You talked about the Pacific um, uh, wind uh, system. Um, how did the Spanish and where did they cross uh, the Americas? And did that then mean they had to rebuild the, uh, to build boats from scratch on the on the the west coast of, of America? Well, yeah, so this this was long long before the uh, Panama Canal was dug, of course. But the Panama Isthmus is nonetheless very very narrow. So, you, so that's you, you, where they went across. Yeah, you, you cross with mules. So you can get yourself across. You, if you want, I guess, carry ships with you or just build them on the far side. And then once you've got that. Pacific trade routes established, you've now got ports like uh, San Francisco and, and Los Angeles, specifically on the Californian coast, because that's just where the wind patterns will, will deliver you. So uh, you then moved on to some of your your questions and let's come on uh, to those which you didn't uh, talk about <laughs> the time in the talk. So what was it that happened half a million uh, years ago, this um, uh, catastrophe that that, uh, that in in England that then uh, uh, led to the, the power. Uh, uh, so the the original Brexit event, what removed uh, the British Isles from mainland Europe and created us as an island in the first place, was an event uh, during an ice age, not during the most recent ice age that we've talked about, but four or five ice age cycles ago and there was a huge ice sheet that had been coming down from the north and it melted and trapped a huge lake of water, like a pro-glacial lake, which was dammed behind the land bridge that joined Dover to Calais. We, we were physically joined by a, a length of, of land, of, of, of rock, uh, until that natural dam basically burst its banks, this enormous lake disgorged itself in what's been described as a catastrophic flood. And when geologists talk about catastrophic floods, this you know this would have had waterfalls a kilometre high, uh, falling right down onto the dry bed of, of the English Channel as it was carving out the channel in the first place. So that was the original Brexit. That's how we were formed as an island. And clearly, the islandness of Britain has been instrumental to how history has played out for us. We've never needed to have much of a standing army to defend ourselves from invaders, unlike uh, uh, other cultures and societies and nations in Europe. We got by with a natural moat and then the Royal Navy to defend us. We've not been invaded in almost a thousand years, over a thousand years. But you could also argue that's not been good, not just for us, but for the stability and equilibrium of Europe as a whole. This island fortress of Britain has been able to prevent anyone else from creating an empire across Europe since the Romans. We stopped Napoleon, we stopped Hitler, and so you can argue that the islandness of Britain has been important in maintaining that balance uh, across Europe and therefore keeping Europe as this um, almost tournament model of lots of smaller nations all competing and jostling with each other and driving innovation, driving economic and technological uh, development. You know, there's a huge amount of macro history that comes down to the fact that, that Britain is an island. And the most recent ice age, you said, uh, finishing some 20 uh, centuries, um, uh, sorry, two, two, uh, 20,000 years ago, yeah. um, so 200 centuries ago, the um, uh, when might be the next one? You, you talked about this being <laughs> first inter ice age era uh, in which human beings have not been in Africa. Um, when might we expect uh, the next climate change notwithstanding? So it's it's cosmic cycles that dictate the rhythm of that ice age drum, the, the beat of the ice ages. And these are called the Milankovitch cycles to do with the wobble of Earth's orbit around the sun or the tilt of the planet. And so you can calculate those, you can project those in the future, you can calculate when the next ice age should occur, and it's within the next few thousand years. So we're coming towards the end of this current interglacial 
were it to be natural. However, <laughs> humans have happened, and industry has happened, the industrial revolution has happened, and we have now pumped out so much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and warmed the global climate so much that it seems almost certain that we have effectively cancelled the next ice age. When these Milankovitch cycles next fall into sync and ought to be triggering an ice age, we've postponed that. There's too much carbon dioxide in the air for that to happen. And indeed, it will take perhaps uh, tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand years, even if we were to stop carbon emissions tomorrow, for Earth's natural systems to reabsorb that CO2 back out of the atmosphere. We, we have had a profound influence on our natural environments. Whereas everything I'm talking about in origins in this book is looking at the flip side of that relationship. How is the Earth that made us in the first place before we had that awesome earth changing power and responsibility with our intelligence and our tools and our technology in the, in the making of the modern world that we live in today. Which brings us very naturally to, to breakfast, uh, Lewis. <laughs> and, and why do we eat cereal for breakfast? My predecessor as Vice Chancellor, Terence Keeley, distinguished medic and academic, described mm. it as the most dangerous meal. Um, what are you going to tell us about? Why breakfast? so? Why, why the most dangerous meal? You would have to read his book okay, uh, very well <laughs> uh, explained uh, in it. Um, so what, what do you eat for, for breakfast, Anthony? What, what is your, your, your meal of choice? Uh, very healthy, Lewis. Uh, um, <laughs> cereal um, uh, 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 and nuts and, and, and fruit. Uh, yes, I think, I think so, most so, of us am, am I being loyal to, 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 to human humanoid history there? No, you are. That, that is a very healthy uh, breakfast. I have uh, porridge for breakfast. So I think most people, uh, both in Britain and around the world, uh, have porridge for breakfast or toast. You eat wheat or you eat uh, bran flakes or you eat corn flakes, maize. And these are all cereals. These are all cereal crops. Uh, or you might be living in China or Korea and have rice for breakfast, which is also a cereal crop. And indeed, it's not just for breakfast, it's for every meal of every day of your life. And for 10,000 years back into our ancestors past, we have fed ourselves on a staple diet of these cereal crops. And the astonishing thing is that these cereal crops are all species of grass. Humanity is as reliant on eating grass as the goats or cows or sheep we keep out to pasture. But biologically, we're not evolved, we're not adapted to eat grass. We don't have the stomach for it, literally. So we've had to apply our brains to the problem rather than our stomachs. And we invented technology that enables to eat grass, cereal crops. We invented the millstone and then the water uh, wheel and the windmill to effectively be technological extensions of our own teeth to grind the grain into flour. And then we used fire and ovens to break that bread, uh, sorry, uh, bake that flour, break down the nutrients so we can absorb them in our stomachs effectively in baking bread. That, that's the fundamental reason why bread is so crucial to humans and why things like the water wheel and the windmill were so important in uh, medieval society and the progression of technology. But it's grass species that our ancestors chose to domesticate in that dawn of agriculture and the dawn of civilization. And keeping with the windmill going to Holland, yeah. why was it that Holland powered the financial um, revolution? Yes, there's, there's another lovely story here about that deep interplay between features of the planet, the geography of the landscape around you and the grand course of history, these deep influences. Mm. And the Netherlands are is a very low-lying region of Europe. And in fact, we've mentioned Doggerland already, which was the seabed of the North Sea that was exposed during the last ice age. Uh, Holland, the Netherlands, with its windmills, is basically reclaiming Doggerland back from the ocean. It's trying to turn back the hands of time 20, 50,000 years in the past to reclaim Doggerland from farmland mm -hmm. um, in Amsterdam and, and in the Netherlands. And if you're trying to build a windmill to pump out the sea and, and drain the land so you can farm it, and a windmill in the 14th, 15th, 16th century was a big, expensive thing. You could 
generate the capital needed to build that by basically getting investment from lots of people around your community. You sell them shares in this uh, capital investment and they therefore then get payback on their shares that they own in it. And then there was a very natural um, economic progression from that mode of thinking, from windmills and draining the low lying landscape you lived in uh, to the Dutch uh, East India Company and heading over with ships to the East Indies and the spice trade, where a ship is a big expensive thing. They're, they're likely to sink and get lost in storms. So the history of capitalism, a lot of it was developed in the Netherlands primarily because it's a low lying region that they needed to drain and pump out the seawater from. There was this um, effect of the landscape on economics and the development of the modern financial system. Fascinating. <laughs> I would love to ask more of this. Uh, not there's any time for one more uh, question, which is uh, London. So why uh, does London have a, a an underground but not too many skyscrapers like New York? Yeah, so um, I think most of us will know that the Alps, this, this big mountain chain in the south of France, was rippled up, was crumpled up when Africa smashed into Eurasia. That the Alps are a product of plate tectonics and continental drift. But in fact, those ripples, that rippling of the crust extends all the way up into England. And the Thames Valley is in one of those ripples from the Alps from the, from the continental collision of Africa. And that filled up with a lot of silt. Basically, is that the North line. Downs and the South Downs? Are both exactly. Those. But the South Downs is an up ripple and the Thames Valley is in a sort of down part of the rippling. But the South Downs is uh, chalklands. It's, mm. it's Cretaceous landscape laid down about 70 uh, million years ago um, in uh, warm tropical seas. There's a chapter in the book that talks about why the chalklands are so important uh, in our history as well. And then the um, North Downs are not chalk. I, I, I don't know. I know the South Downs are. I, I don't know off the top of my head know that the North Downs are. But on the so they might be. And then the, the coming down. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Exactly. Uh, but the Thames Estuary is, is a dip in that, rimple, in that ripple and it filled up with lots of very fine sediment which is rubbish for trying to build skyscrapers in. You have to dig very deep foundations to support a skyscraper in this London mud, but it's exceptional for tunnelling through. So London was the earliest city in the world to start getting a metro, an underground, a tube system, but was not naturally set up because of the geology for building skyscrapers. New York is effectively the opposite. Manhattan has areas where the rippling of the land uh, has brought very hard rock close to the surface in Midtown and Downtown, the financial district at the bottom of Manhattan Island. And so if you look, and you could do that right now, you can go on Google Maps, Google Street View, and look at the skyscrapers in Manhattan, and they are mostly around Midtown or around the bottom of Manhattan Island um, because of the oh. rocks that are there. Didn't know that at all. Uh, one of uh, uh, many, many things, Lewis, I, I've uh, uh, learned from you in the last hour, and I'm sure that everyone looking at this will have learned a great deal uh, also. Um, and um, I think we need to send an urgent message uh, there about how easy London is to tunnel uh, through to <laughs> the Crossrail team who clearly, they should, they should be uh, up ideas. clearly have, have not heard about that, which is why there are so many years running late and so many billions of pounds uh, over budget. Uh, Lewis, if they had actually come uh, and uh, uh, heard you lecture or uh, <laughs> r r read your books, uh, we'd have had Crossrail up and running by now. That that was uh, a wonderful and such a broad um, talk, uh, just what I, I like and think goes so well in this series. So from all of us uh, watching tonight, uh, to you, Lewis Dartnell, thank you so very, very much indeed. A wonderful talk. Thank and you very bye -bye. much for having me. Thanks so much. Cheers.